Welcome to City Church. City Church is a biblically based, relationally driven, spirit led church, encouraging everyone to follow Jesus and serve others. We're excited to share this sermon with you today, and you can always find out more about us online at citychurchseville.com. I've asked this question every Sunday that I've preached through the Advent series that we focused on with Incarnation of Jesus. How many of you have all your Christmas shopping done? How many of you have extreme anxiety right now because I asked you that question and you've done nothing? Good news is, as I was online yesterday and ordered something off Amazon for my son and it will arrive in time for Christmas. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not sure how much longer that'll last. Well, listen, what we're doing is we are processing through the idea of incarnation. What it means when God takes on flesh. What it means when we talk about God with meat on. My favorite sermon that I've ever heard preached was preached here 18 years ago by a friend of mine named Chuck. And the title of his sermon was God with meat on. Incarnation, you can hear the Spanish word carne in incarnation. It's the idea that God takes on flesh. Now, what we're getting ready to read is the story of the birth of Jesus through the Gospel of Luke. And when we begin to read it, we're going to read about the actual birth of Jesus and what led up to the birth of their first son. Now, when I think about the idea of the birth of Jesus and the incarnation and Mary and Joseph and the excitement of their son going to be born, I think about the birth of my son, Peter Joseph. Um, Peter's now 26 years old. A lot of time has passed since his birth, but I still recall some of it. By the way, men, don't ever say we've had a baby. Just doesn't fly well and for good reason. But I think about when Peter uh, was going to be born. And we're going to read the ramp up to the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke in just a moment. But I remember my ramp up with my wife, Fran. And our ramp up was very different than Mary and Joseph's. Mine was going to a hospital and taking a tour of the maternity ward. We were in Princeton, New Jersey at the time, and there was a battle between hospitals to get you to come there and have your baby because there's huge money in that, huge money. And so we literally took tours of a few hospitals, and then we chose the maternity ward. It was like picking a wedding venue. It was, you know, which one's best, and the one we chose was brand new. And uh, one of the things that they had that my wife loved if I remember this correctly, at least one of the hospitals, if not all, had this, where they had just put in a system where they would put a band on my son's wrist, and if he got within 25 feet of a door, the entire maternity ward would go into lockdown. Fran loved that, just thought that was the best. I remember touring the one that we chose, and they had fine cabinetry on the walls. You, you felt like you were in the Ritz-Carlton, not in a maternity ward. And they said, here's what's amazing. When Fran comes in here, we'll first put her in this whirlpool. And they showed us a whirlpool. Literally, it was like the Ritz-Carlton. So she'll sit in the whirlpool. And then when it's her time, we'll help her get out. And she'll sit in the bed. And there was cherry cabinets all around the room. And we'll open those up. And they opened them. They started pulling out medical equipment. And as soon as the baby's born, we're going to put it all away and close it up again. It'll look like the Ritz-Carlton again. And Fran said, I want to have Peter here or Truth of it is, we didn't know the sex of our child, but she said, I want to have my baby here. And the whole time, what am I thinking, men? What am I thinking? <laughs> How much is this going to cost me? That's what I'm thinking the entire time. Fran's saying, this is utterly amazing. But I want you to picture this, that whenever you read the Newer Testament... We are reading Eastern literature, and Eastern literature is written in such a way where you're supposed to use your sanctified imagination. You've been using it when I was describing the hotel room, you thought, or the, yeah, I keep calling it a hotel room, the birthing ward, right? 
and the maternity ward was what it was called. Um, but you've been kind of picturing that in your mind. The way the Bible is written is you are to use a sanctified imagination and picture what's happening. And so what I want you to do as we read together, you're going to read out loud with me, as we read together the story of the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, I want you to picture it. I want you to picture what's happening. And here's another thing. The way the Bible is written, when you see a word repeated or a phrase repeated, that's the point of what you just read. And what's strange is what actually gets repeated and what we're getting ready to read. Let's read together. Are you ready to read out loud? Are you ready? All right, let's read. Luke 2, 1 through 16. Here we go. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Push the pause button. Did you notice that Mary did not get to pick the maternity ward? Reading on. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, A great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. As we began to read, you would have noticed something that maybe forces you to go back to like eighth grade history. And it was the name that the chapter began with. And the name wasn't Jesus. It was Caesar Augustus. And the text tells us that Caesar Augustus issued a decree and the entire world moved. That's stunning. The entire known world, which, oh, by the way, the Roman Empire under his leadership had brought together, moved. Everyone did. Now, what we need to know, though, is that Caesar Augustus has a history. And the Bible's assuming that you know it. And the history is this. Caesar Augustus was born by the name of Octavian. At some point, his uncle, Julius Caesar, adopted him legally. And he became the heir to Julius Caesar's throne. Julius, I'm sorry, Caesar Augustus had unified some barbarian tribes with some very sophisticated tribes And he brought them together, and that's where the Roman Empire comes from. But he did it through an extremely violent, bloody civil war. The last person of note that he defeated was Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony took his own life after he was defeated by Caesar Augustus. What we know is, is that Caesar Augustus began to proclaim that he had brought peace to the world. He not only that, he declared 
that his adoptive father, who was then deceased, Julius Caesar, was to be viewed as divine, that he was to be worshipped, which meant that he, Caesar Augustus, was the son of God. That's important to know. Now, if you would remember your eighth grade history, you would know that Caesar Augustus ushered in what was called Pax Romana. That's Latin for Rome's peace or Roman peace. He was known as the king of the world. He was known as the Lord. Caesar Augustus was known as the one who had ushered peace into the world. Now we understand why the angels announced what they did, that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar Augustus, and that he has brought peace into the world. But notice, what you notice is that Caesar Augustus got his power through violence, through political savvy, and through being related to the right people. That's how he got his authority, and that's how he kept it. Then what we discover is we read the birth story of Jesus, the actual story. Unlike mine and Fran, where we went to several hospitals, we looked at maternity wards, we discover that Mary and Joseph took a pretty long journey. When they arrived in the city of David, the the city where King David was born, and that's important because Joseph is of the line of David. When they arrived in that city, the house where they stayed, the guest room was already taken. And so they gave birth to Jesus in the living room, which is where the animals were kept. And there was a manger dug in to the floor. Please notice that the birth of Jesus is anything but the birth of a king. It doesn't look like it. And having been raised on a farm, I can tell you it didn't smell like it either. Jesus was born, and he was placed into a manger. A rock hole that was dug out in the floor of that home. And Jesus was wrapped in cloth, and he was placed there. His birth was natural, because he's fully human. His conception was supernatural, because he's fully God. And he is now born into this world and he is placed in a manger like every other shepherd baby has been for centuries, for centuries. But please take note that his birth would have gone completely unnoticed. It would have been absolutely invisible had it not been for what happens next with the angels. When I think about the birth of Jesus, I think about all of the young mothers over the last approximate year that have given birth to babies here through the City Church family. What's amazing is no one could go visit. I am in the habit, my wife's in the habit of going to the hospital after a baby is born and celebrating with the new mom. It always kind of freaks me out, but the mothers always want me to hold their newborn baby. I let Fran do the honors. By the way, this cheap aside, I always found that parenting got better when my children could talk. But thinking about the birth of Jesus, here he is in this home, laid in a manger that was hewn out of the stone floor. And then the angels do what angels do. They announce the connection of heaven and earth. That's what angels do. They announce the connection of heaven to earth. But who they announce to is incredible. The Bible tells us that the angels come to shepherds. Now, to understand what that means, you would have to know what all of the biblical historians tell us, that shepherds during the time of Jesus were of the lowest class of people. It would have been shepherds, and then some other profession that your mind goes to is being of the lowest rung of people. But what the text tells us is they were below the lowest rung, and here's why. It says they were in the fields at night living with the sheep. The person that owned the sheep didn't do that. 
Those that they had hired to watch the sheep would be out there in the cold of night living with the sheep. The owner was in the warmth of their home. So not only are these shepherds of the lowest rung, and we know from extra-biblical literature, shepherds could not give voice in the court of law. They were viewed as untrustworthy, maybe somewhere close to where some of us might view gypsies. That's how they were viewed. Now with that in mind, think about who the angels choose to announce that God's son is now in the world. Who do they choose? They choose the lowest of the lowest. And what's noteworthy to me is the angel says, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to go to the city of David, to Bethlehem. And when you get there, here's what is the sign you are to watch for. Shepherds, go to the city of David, go to Bethlehem, and here's the sign. And who remembers what the sign is? You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger on the floor. That's what you're to look for. That's the sign. Now, if I'm God, there would have been any number of signs, but that wouldn't have been one of them. I can promise you. There would have been fireworks. There would have been all different kinds of things. But I can tell you that the sign that I would want the shepherds to look for would not have been that, but it was. Shepherds, go to a home. And when you find a baby in that little village, wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger on the floor, you know that you have found the King of Kings, the Lord, the incarnate God. You have found him. Now, when you look at this text, you discover very quickly that the angels are pretty excited. The first angel shows up and makes the announcement that in Luke chapter 2, verse 12, listen, shepherds, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And then on the heels of that, it's almost though that angel's friends can't contain themselves anymore. And they burst through and they step into the earthly world and they make this incredible announcement. And it is this, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Please know that if Caesar Augustus would have heard that announcement, he would have made a move to kill the child. How do I know? Because his right-hand man, Herod, did that for him. You see, Caesar Augustus viewed himself as the king of peace. He viewed himself as the one that had finally brought peace to the entire world. But the angels are announcing that's not true. Because here's what I can promise you. Political reality can't bring you this kind of peace. Military might cannot bring you this kind of peace. Political savvy and being born into the right network cannot bring you this kind of peace. Because this kind of peace is found in the Older Testament and it's called shalom. That word means when things that have been unbound and torn apart are now brought together. That's what that word for peace means. It means that what was once whole and was once together has been violently torn apart. And now peace is when they come together. So when the angels in heaven look through the portal from which God's son has now passed into the world, they follow suit and they come in. And when they come in, they make that incredible announcement that now peace is on earth. The fracture between heaven and earth, what's been torn apart, is now slowly being brought together again. And it's in a person. It's in a person, it's in the incarnation of God that this is happening. And he is the peace. He's the one that brings together the halves that have been torn apart. He is the shalom. 
Now, as we think about this and we process this, we begin to understand what the Gospels want us to understand. The Gospel wants us to understand that this was God's choice to do this. God is the one that made this choice. And the angels announce that there's now peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Notice, it was not men's goodwill towards God. It's God's goodwill toward humankind. And in that moment, heaven truly touches earth. I want to say something very clearly. I want to be clear about this. That if you look to political reality, military might, wealth, and being connected to find your peace, you are in Caesar Augustus' world. That's his world. I'm not saying don't be involved in those arenas. What I am saying is that the peace of God, the shalom of God will never be found there. It can't be because political systems, financial systems, human connections through birth, human savvy with who you know and who you get connected with, those are all of human making. Jesus alone is totally divine and totally human. And he is the Prince of Peace. So as I think about us just days away from Christmas, and I think about us thinking again about the birth story of Jesus into the world, and I say this every single time I preach on Christmas because we must hear this, we have to know this, and it is this, that only two of the Gospels mention the nativity, but all four mention the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And if he had not been raised from the dead, you would have never heard of Christmas. It would be gone. Only half of the Gospels, as they were written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, felt it important enough to put the Christmas story in there. But all four, up to half of the Gospel, is spent talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The birth of Jesus is about the resurrection in the end. So how do we put feet to our faith with what we've heard? What does it look like for women and men who follow Jesus, or maybe women and men who are checking out faith and are checking out Jesus? What do we do? How do we move into this? What does that look like to put feet to your faith? The first thing I want to tell you is that the most repeated theme in the scriptures we just read was this. Lying in a manger. That's what was repeated three times in those 16 verses that we read. The Gospels want you to know that there was a baby lying in a manger. That God is incarnate in this world. That Jesus was born in a way and in a place where everyone's welcome to come and in, be invited to his birth. But beyond that, how do I put feet to my faith? Well, I do what the shepherds did. I pray you will as well. What we read tells us is that they came and they found a baby in a manger. And the next phrase is awesome. And it was just the way the angel had said. They believed that what the angel said about this child is absolutely true that he is God in the flesh, he's the Messiah, he's the Lord, and in him there is a peace, and through him heaven has now begun to connect with earth. Would you stand with me as we close out our time? As we stand together in a moment, we're going to move towards worship. And as we do... I would like for you, with your sanctified imagination, to picture again. There you are. You're there by the manger. And you look at the child. 
and you think about everything that the angel has said, you have a choice. Are you going to believe that it's true? What I choose to picture, what I choose to believe, was prophesied 700 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, not Caesar Augustus, but on his. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Will you believe in him? Will you put your faith, your hope, and your trust in him? That baby who was bound up in cloth and laid in a major.